I like starting talking about observability with a few basics about how to think about data, how to think about observability, and then we get into the cloud native part. If you look at this, this is uh, a screenshot from Yanitza uh, interface, which shows you how, how power levels fluctuate over time. And in the circled area, you see, you see a few spikes in, in, in voltage. If you go back a little bit, um, this is the Stahlschlüssel from Germany. Um, any property of any steel you can commercially buy on Earth, anywhere, this includes Japan and everything, can be found in this one book. And all of those chemical and physical and everything properties have been distilled into, into numbers. Going back even further, um, this is a logbook from a whaler. Um, where they logged, where they are, where they went, um, what they caught. This is the oldest letter we know of, 4,000 years old. It is a complaint letter, because the seller offered the wrong grade of copper, the buyer is still making provisional payment, and also the seller was rude to the, to the buyer's servant. And this is the oldest writing we know of. This is 6,000 6, years old. It tabulates who owned what slaves at what time. All of those things have one thing in common. Humanity, at its core, took anything which was, which was of interest, commercial or societal or whatever, wrote this down in a detailed account over time, figured out that this wasn't efficient enough, distilled this into logs, or into key events, and then when those became too much, started distilling those into numbers to do actual math with. You'll see why this is relevant in a bit. Let's start from a different angle, observability and SRE. So who here has heard of observability? Interesting, and heard of SRE? Okay. Okay, different crowd, okay. So observability is a fancy term for, for monitoring, basically. Um, and at least in the cloud native scene, uh, within CNCF and such, the term is everywhere as like the obvious term, which, which you must be doing. SRE is site reliability engineering, and this is describing how Google runs their production services internally. Uh, both of them are at least in the cloud native world where I'm coming from. Um, absolute buzzwords and everyone claims to do it, even though maybe they're not. So let's talk about buzzwords for a bit. Buzzwords at some point become, become more or less meaningless. They lose the initial reason why they were initially useful, um, but still they have this kernel of truth. So one thing which is super common in, um, in human culture, in human nature, uh, is so-called cargo culting, where you observe behavior and you want to replicate the success of the behavior without actually understanding what is coming in between. Um, this term comes from the Pacific Islanders during World War II. They observed that soldiers were building small lighthouses and landing strips and such. And they observed that the gods sent gift from heaven, as in planes came and they dropped cargo. And to this day, there are proto-religions in this region where they built small lighthouses, where they built small uh, landing strips as an incorporation in their local religion, because um, their desire from their ancestors back then was so strong to replicate the success of the others without actually understanding what, what that is. Uh, also, just to check, does, who, does, who knows what monitoring is? I hope for, raise your hand, okay. There's a tough crowd. <laughs> monitoring is an automated way to extract data from your systems to make certain that the system state is, in the is matching the desired state. So are my servers up? Are they replying within X amount of time? This kind of thing. Um, so I don't have to do this joke on how, how observability, whatever, <laughs> I work with her. So um, both monitoring and observability at the core are about collecting data and making use of the data. In particular, observability is, um, is emphasizing the usage of the data. 
Um, the initial definition of observability from control theory is how much of a system can I deduce by just looking, or a system state can I deduce by just looking at the inputs and the outputs. So if you cannot ask why something is not working, it's not going to be very useful. So just stating that something is the case is not completely useless, but it's oftentimes about asking deeper questions. That joke bombs here, okay. If you can't ask new questions on the fly, it's not observability. Another important thing to think about while you, while you provision your services and run your services, in particular in the cloud native uh, world, complexity. I personally like to discern between fake complexity and real system inherent complexity, where you should always try to get rid of fake complexity. Real system inherent complexity is something you cannot do away with. Like if you, if you sell shoes online, you have to store who paid, what shoes you have, you have to deal with this complexity. Also, if you are subject to regulations, like for example in finance, um, those are for your intents and purposes, real system inherent complexity. And you cannot, you cannot just do away with this complexity, but you can move it around, you can compartmentalize it, and ideally you distill meaning from it so others who are not as an expert in that part can still get, uh, as you hopefully are, can still get, get use out of this. So services. Um, services to me are comp compartmentalized complexity with interfaces to the outside world. They have different teams, different owners, and contracts define those interfaces. Why do I like the term contracts? Of course, it is, it is telling you that you actually need to sit down, you need to agree. In writing, you cannot just say, oh, okay, no, I didn't think my system would be doing this, like it's not my fault. No, you need to agree up front what the properties of the system are. An internet layer is a, is a super common term where without the different layers of like uh, physical and uh, connection layer and, and IP and TCP, UDP, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the internet literally wouldn't exist in its, in its current state. Other examples, even if you cook yourself at home, you won't grow every last cucumber. You always have service interfaces for, for other services which you consume and which you provide. And now, again, this is based, uh, I, I thought people here would know what SRE is. SRE, again, is uh, Site Reliability Engineers. That's the name for the people at Google who actually run the services. Um, and it's a hugely successful model. They have written books about this. Arguably, it, it jump-started quite a large fraction of the, of the cloud-native space. And at the core, to me, this is about alignment of incentives where normally you have, you, have your, um, you have your engineers and their, or your software engineers, they are being paid by features shipped. You have the ops people who are being paid by things not breaking. You have the product people who need to ship new features. Uh, and everyone is fighting each other. Uh, they don't really, they don't really uh, pull together. Error budgets change this because you introduce one common currency where is the service up? Is it quick enough? Is it returning errors? And if any of those are happening, everyone spends the same error budget. So it doesn't matter if the developers are really, really aggressive in their feature development, if product is doing A-B testing, if the thing is hard to run and so operations people have issues and it breaks all the time, everyone is all of a sudden talking about the same fundamental thing. SLI, SLO, SLA are again like buzzwords in the cloud native space. Um, they are what you measure, what you want to hit, and what you must hit. It's really simple. A lot of people are confused about this one. And finally, um, another advantage of, of this more common approach across the org is a shared understanding, where everyone is using the same tools and dashboards, hopefully, which means that you're looking at the same numbers. You don't have to have a fight when you meet with your manager and that other team, and everyone has a discussion about whose numbers are the, re are the least bad. Um, and one thing is green and the other is yellow and one is top down. You don't have those fights if everyone is working with the same underlying data and with the same uh, dashboards. Alerting, who of you run production uh, workloads, like are responsible for, uh, for production? Okay. Um, so 
those are hopefully um, on call for, for the services. On call is being defined as if something breaks, the computer automatically calls you and tells you about it to, uh, for you to then fix whatever is broken, whatever you can prevent. And the thing is, a lot of time people, people do alerts based on, on symptoms, like that database is down. And that's not what your customers, what your users actually care about. They care about, is the service quick? Is it slow? Am I re is it returning errors? Can I buy this pair of shoes? Your operations people are humans. So ideally, they get rest and they get sleep, because else they won't be doing their peak performance. So this slide is about arguing that you should only be alerting on things which are currently or imminently customer impacting. Everything else, you can raise a ticket, you can send email, uh, you can deal with it during business hours. You don't have to wake someone up in the middle of the night because that one machine is down. As long as the end user services are up and running and the money still flows, no one cares about that one machine. So. That's the, that's the base layer for, for getting into, into Prometheus and other technologies. So he, who here actually knows what Prometheus is? Okay. So Prometheus is the, who here knows what Cloud Native Computing Foundation is? Okay. Okay, yeah, it's a tough crowd, but that's good, like spread knowledge. Um, Prometheus is a monitoring system. Uh, it's metrics based and again, like building on what Google did, um, it is inspired, heavily inspired by Google Sporkmon, which is part of what allowed Google to grow in their early years. Without this, Google would not be as large. Prometheus is an open source re-implementation of Sporkmon. We'll see a little bit about this later. It's a time series database. Uh, I'll explain what those are in a bit. Uh, everything internally is 64-bit uh, values, which makes it extremely efficient on modern architectures. There is a system of instrumentation and exporters. Instrumentation being defined as you put code in your applications and directly emit data about that application. Exporters translate from MySQL, from Oracle, from whatever, into something which, uh, which Prometheus can understand. It's not for event logging, and dashboarding is commonly done via Grafana. The main si uh, selling points, it has a highly dynamic uh, built-in service discovery. So if you run Kubernetes, or if you run on any uh, cloud provider, if you run on, or even if you just have a DNS zone, or you have a, a file uh, where all your services are listed, you literally can just give this to Prometheus, and it starts uh, scraping, it starts monitoring all those services, all those endpoints for you. You don't have to do manual configuration or anything, it's all fully automated. Again, if you use Kubernetes, any cloud provider, everything happens as if by magic. It doesn't have a hierarchical data model, it has an n-dimensional matrix, so you can slice and dice your, your matrix as you need, because if you have, I don't know, you have region, country, data center, customer, and then you want to group by customer, everything is wrong and you, you need to like go up in the tree, you need to do for if, la, la, la. You don't have to do this when everything is attached as key value pairs onto your data and you can just select by whatever key value pair you want. There's one single language which you need to learn for, for everything, processing, graphing, alerting, everything. It's really uh, simple to operate and it's highly efficient. It's pull-based, so it takes the data from, um, from the systems. There's, there's also a push-based model where all the systems which are supposed to be alive send data to the monitoring system. Both are valid. They have some fine-grained distinctions, but that's too far from here. You just need to know that it's pull-based. Black box monitoring is being defined as I look at, at a thing from the outside. Does the HTTP server reply yes or no? How quickly? Blah, blah, blah. Versus white box, I actually know about the inner workings of this and that program, of this and that application, and emit data directly. Um, yep. Services ideally have their own metrics endpoints, so you don't have to have this one huge thing where everything is coming from and you do a partial upgrade and everything breaks and everyone is unhappy and no one likes you anymore. You have distinct endpoints per, per service. Within Prometheus, we have extremely hard guarantees on stability. So, I mean, we know that you want to 
be asleep ideally and you want to sleep sound because you know your services are up and running. Uh, so we don't want to introduce breakage on our end. We are extremely stringent about not breaking anything. And every six weeks, there is a new release candidate. So what are time series? Time series are just recorded values which change over time. And you write down what the value was and you write down when it was. And you do this again and again and again and again and you attach metadata about what it is. Individual ev events are usually, usually merged into counters, like how many people logged into my website, for example, or gorgeous, um, how much RAM am I currently using, or histograms, how much latency do I have on this and that service, uh, and what is the latency distribution, like 99% of my users have at maximum X waiting time, so they are happy. I know they're happy because they don't have a lot of waiting time. Yeah. It's really easy to, to emit, read, and parse those. This is how it looks. I know someone who literally prints F from their C code, and he puts this into, into a file, serves this file on a web server, and that's how he did his instrumentation for Prometheus. And that has been working for years and years now. So how can you use this? Um, if you, for example, want to ask, um, what partitions do you have? all of the ones which are uh, not root and have at least 100 gigabytes of, uh, of capacity. So you can select node file. This is node is, is the name of the exporter. It exports Unix systems towards Prometheus. For my file systems in my bytes total, not mounted on slash, which is root, divided by 1 to the power of 10 uh, by, by 9, so uh, 1 billion, which is wrong in this example, actually. No, I, no, it's not, because we have over 100. No, it's not wrong. So this is a billion. And then um, it, it needs to be over 100. That is the query. And this would be in a random system, your, your return. You see this and that device on this and that mount point on this and that system. And it has this and that gigabytes, uh, amount of gigabytes of storage or capacity. You can also do more complex things, like, for example, what is the ratio of request, uh, of request errors? That's another one of those things. Um, I don't care about if I have one error. I don't care if I have 10,000 errors. I care if I, I am above a certain percentage of errors. Because if I have one error per day, but I only have one user per day, that's really bad. If I have 10,000 errors per second, but I have 10 million requests per second, that's not that bad. So it's always, I, I want to have the ratio, and that's how I get this ratio. Basically, I, I summarize by path, path is this uh, label here, how many requests do I get per second over the last five minutes, which have a status of 500, which is HTTP error, and then I divide this by all the requests per second over the last five minutes, and then a random service might give me this as my as my response. So you can do really deep analysis. And as you can see, you don't need to know about what systems exist or anything. You just run the query. And no matter if you have one or 10,000 systems, everything, all the computation happens automatically. There's a new few. Uh, those are the main features of the last of the last 12 months. Um, remote write receiver, so you can also push data towards Prometheus. Trigonometric functions, so you can do sine wave and cosine and things like these, because the use case we had is someone was uh, monitoring their wind turbines, um, and they needed to know what angle those wind turbines were into, into the wind, so that's why we added those. Agent mode, where if you have uh, corporate requirements for um, like opening very few ports on your systems or something, you can use the agent and it basically forwards a lot of data from systems towards Prometheus without Prometheus needing to know about every last one of those. We have long-term support versions. Again, we have new releases or new release candidates every six weeks. Uh, the long-term support versions are usually uh, supported for at least half a year, depending on user feedback. But if you don't want to upgrade as often, but still want to have all the security patches, you can have it. And out of order ingestion, uh, where you can basically send data which is older than what Prometheus would normally expect, that's probably too in-depth for, 
for this crowd here. And the next uh, feature, the next highlight feature will be native histograms, where you can put a lot more resolution into your histograms. So you can figure out um, with a lot more detail, for example, what your latency distributions are when customers want to access a web service or something. Prometheus and Kubernetes are the cloud native defaults. Um, Kubernetes is the open source re-implementation of Google Spork. Prometheus is the open source re-implementation of uh, Google Sporkmon. And both of those, again, are the thing which actually allowed Google to, to grow in the early 90s. Without them, they wouldn't have been able to. So even though they started in different areas, Prometheus and Kubernetes are, the, are written with each other in mind by, by the initial creators, because they knew how it was done at Google. They are also the two founding projects in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the two oldest one, blah, 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 always those two. A little bit about scaling, this is just Prometheus. It's absolutely not a problem to, to ingest more than one million samples per second on this laptop. No problem, long term, it just works. You come out at roughly um, 200, 250,000 samples per second in core, which you can ingest. Um, we compress those 16 bytes, because two times 64 bit from earlier, if you remember, to consistently 1.36 bytes per sample. So there's a very good compression built into the system. And a Prometheus server itself is reliable into the tens of millions of active series. The largest Prometheus I know of has 125 million active series, as in data which it actively ingests again and again and again, usually every 10 to 60 seconds. So let's talk about other things. Mimir, who knows what Grafana is? Okay. So Mimir is a project uh, by Grafana Labs uh, based on Prometheus. Most of, the, most of the development for Mimir actually happens in, uh, or a lot of it happens in Prometheus, and M Mimir is based on it. Mimir metrics, yes, we have this thing with the first letter. And the history, for those who care, um, basically there was Prometheus first, then Cortex split off from this, then from this we created Grafana Enterprise metrics, and based on this we have Mimir. Mimir actually scales to one billion active series. So at any time and point, you're actively ingesting one billion different data points from different uh, time series every 10 to 60 seconds. And it scales to this level. It's really, really fast in, in query performance. You have multi-tenancy if you need it, access control, three-way re replication. Of course, Prometheus is its own instance, and if it goes away, it goes away. And it can ingest open telemetry data, dot graphite influx, other protocols which which you cannot do with um, with Prometheus. So for those one billion active series within one cluster, we need one thousand five hundred machines at a cost of seven thousand CPU cores and thirty terabytes of RAM, which is a lot. But for that scale, it's actually not that much. Loki, like Prometheus, but for logs. It uses the same fundamental uh, metadata level with, uh, or structure with, um, with key value pairs. And this is for logs, Loki, yeah. <laughs> um, and one thing which, which you have with a lot of logging systems is, in my opinion, they, they do the, the wrong trade-off, where either they have um, full text indexing, and you pay for all the full text indexing, like in the licensing, in the compute, in the storage, in the RAM, in network. You double your, your storage alone from, from full text indexing. And most of the things in your, in your logs you will never ever search for. Or the other thing where you have a data lake, which is to me a euphemism for keeping your storage vendor happy. Because um, you just keep, keep buying more storage and no one ever really actually looks at the data. You just keep it and you keep it. Um, so what Loki does is similar to what Prometheus does. It only indexes the labels, those key value pairs which we saw, and everything else is an opaque blob. You can put whatever in. I know someone who pu puts photos in there because he wants to. It works at really high scale without all this massive cost which you have with more traditional systems. I won't name them. And you have a flexible schema on read. So you don't have this thing from SQL where you are really tied to, to specific happy paths of reading 
uh, with your indexes and everything, you can actually be flexible in how you want to extract the data and how you want to mangle your data while you get it out and while you put it in your alerts, in your dashboards, in your reports, in your further processing, whatever. And there's a really easy way to turn logs into metrics, which the savings we will see at the end of this talk. It looks basically the same. You have a timestamp, then you have your label set, and then you have whatever is at the end. The slides will also be uploaded right when I'm done with the At Grafana, as of two months ago, we are ingesting 160 by terabytes per day in our largest cluster. We have multiple, but that's the largest one. Queries regularly see speeds higher of 80 gigabytes per second just on standard cloud hardware or cloud instances, which means you can query terabytes of data in under a minute. And yes, this includes all the complex processing of the result set. Tempo for traces. Uh, who here knows what distributed traces are? Okay. So uh, distributed traces are basically charting the path through, through your application, or generally traces chart the path through your application, which on more, more traditional systems is really or relatively easy. Of course, I have one application, and I'm running through this thing. If you ever use a debugger like GDB or something, that's what this is, or what you can do with it. Distributed tracing uh, is due to the fact that on, on more dynamic workloads in cloud, you have more smaller services. You don't have to have those microservices, but even if you have a modern web shop, you probably have two or three different things which do the computation before someone can actually buy their thing. Distributed tracing charts this path through your system so you actually know this one request from that one user took this and that pathway and it took really long here and then it arrowed out over here. Like Things like these are possible with distributed tracing. They are a lot more expensive than uh, logs or metrics, which is why I started with how, how we always condense, because we are basically at this complete story of something happening again. Um, but they're very valuable. Usually you, you take fewer or a lot fewer uh, traces than other things. So Tempo is a system which allows you to do cloud-native uh, distributed tracing, also at really cloud scales. One of the tricks which Tempo has, which no one else has, is something else which, which comes from Google initially. When many years ago I, I was at Google and or I had a meeting at Google and we were discussing about merging certain projects, didn't end up working, but whatever. Um, and they mentioned that searching for traces didn't scale. And when Google tells you that searching for something doesn't scale, they probably did the math. So the thing is, when you do the thing with log, uh, with with uh, labels on uh, on your logs, on your metrics, which works on your logs and your metrics, it's actually too expensive to also do this on your traces. But you don't have to. Of course, the thing is, I already distilled the meaning from my traces. I already distilled this and that thing is is a, a slow query. I already know that this and that thing is throwing errors. So I don't have to do this analysis. I don't have to do this in-depth search on my traces. I can use exemplars. Exemplars are really simple. They are just an ID which I attach to a trace. And then I store this, tra uh, this exemplar, this trace ID, with my logs, with my, trace, uh, with my metrics. And if I see that I have this and that error, and there is an exemplar attached to it, I can jump directly into that one trace. And I know it is relevant because I know it happened with this and that error. I don't have to like figure out needle in haystack, is this thing actually worthwhile uh, out of the other five million traces. Or if I have that one slow query response, I know this is coming. Like I see this in my, ex in my histogram, I can jump directly into the trace. So that's what, what tempo and exemplars are for. It does support uh, searching by, by labels and by label sets for those who need or want it. Um, it only needs an object store. You don't need Elastic or Cassandra or anything in the background, which makes it a lot cheaper than pretty much everything you can find. It's 100% compatible with open telemetry uh, tracing, Sipking, Jaeger, everything. And at Grafana internally, we don't do sampling. Sampling is I choose a number, 1%, and I throw away 99% of my, of my data, 
in the hopes that the 1% is something which I can actually use, which is super frustrating because if I, if I happen to throw away something which I would have needed and I see the reference, it should exist, but it's been thrown away. Super frustrating. The system is cheap enough so we don't have to do sampling. We don't have to throw away our, our data. Also, as of three months ago, um, at Grafana, we are ingesting 2.2 million uh, samples per second at a sustained th 350 megabytes per second, uh, which comes out to, or we peak regularly to, to 5 million samples, and then we re-instrument, because that's the happy spot for, for us, this amount of, in, of insight. And at 14 day retention with three copies stored, I, oh, sorry, I forgot to, to put in the, the compute cost. Um, send me email later, I can, I can give you the numbers. And the latencies of, of doing this analysis um, is super low. Like 99% of all requests come back within 2.5 seconds to the system. 50% of those are coming back within 1.6 uh, seconds. By the way, those P percentiles, those are what you can do with histograms like service latencies. This is, goes too far for this talk, but again, send me email if you want know, to know more about this. Flare is for profiling. Um, who knows what profiling is? So profiling is uh, I look at my application and I can see uh, how much time, how much CPU time, how much memory, how much real time do I spend in a certain part of my code, in this and that function, in this and that loop, whatever. Do I actually do computation or do I, do I, um, do I just wait for someone else? Uh, am I stuck in, in, in some loop? Am I losing uh, memory? Uh, as in, have I, do I have a memory leak? Things like these are really easy to discern with profiling. Again, it's a relatively expensive view of the world because metrics and logs are more efficient. Um, but it's extremely useful for optimization. So once your systems are up and running and they don't break all the time anymore, cost reduction and efficiency increase and, and speed increase is really easy with this. <coughs> uh, currently, there are two languages supported to, to send data into the system uh, for Go, standard preprof. Anyone who develops anything in Go gets this basically free as part of the Golang uh, development kit. You can just hit the pprof endpoint. If you don't know that your Go application has a pprof endpoint, it most likely does. And it's super useful information which you can just find for free. And for Java, we have a project where you can, uh, where you can emit literally the same data in the same format about Java and we'll add more and more and more over time. So, I told you that um, traces and profiles are really expensive and logs and metrics are way more efficient and cheap. But let's look at just the difference between logs and metrics. Again, this is data from, from, our, own, from our own clusters with extremely large data sets. When I would be doing full text indexing of 10 terabytes of data. I would come out at roughly 20 terabytes of data uh, with the full text index. That's not what we are doing, but that's like the rough scale of what could be happening. If I ingest one terab uh, 10 terabytes of logs into Loki, I obviously have to store those, those uh, 10 terabytes. But the index, the thing which you actually have to search through, is only 200 megabytes of data, which is uh, three, six or seven orders of magnitude less. Uh, like it, 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 it's insane, this difference. This is why we are not doing full text indexing. But even with this uh, efficient thing, average logs at Grafana come out at roughly 600 bytes per, per log line, including index and everything. Metrics, as we saw earlier, come out at 1.36 bytes per second, as we saw earlier. Um, so just going on those two numbers, even in the already reduced index, just going on those numbers, when I can turn a log line into a counter, like for example, I have an error and I can write a log about this, but I can also in theory just up my counter for this and that error 
put my labels on it so I know what, like where it happens and everything, but I just up this number. This gives me a 99.8 reduction in storage size just for the first log line. And afterwards, within the storage time, which is usually two hours, it is literally free. Of course, it doesn't matter to Prometheus if I'm, if I'm storing a one or a 10 billion, but it would matter in logs. So you have incredible power to, to take large data sets and become really, really efficient with your, thank you, with your data sets. Yeah, that's the, that's the main message. That's also why I started on this, how humanity did it again and again and again over the millennia, because as humanity, we always came, uh, we came out at the same. So bringing all of this together, with this stack, you can jump from logs to traces, metrics to traces, traces to logs, and all the other ways, because they're all interconnected, those systems on the back end. All of this is open source. You can run it yourself. Um, if you want to pay for goods and services, Grafana Labs is happy to. I like food and shelter. But all of what I talked about is completely open source. And those are a few screenshots. For those who don't actually know what Grafana is, um, like I can, I can show different um, different graphs, I can stack them if I want to do those calculations, I can have, yeah, total, I mean, you can see the graphs yourself. Um, I can put key events in here, errors or alerts or deployments of new things. I can also do stuff like ge geographical overview or, or heat maps, things like these. Thank you, and we have five minutes for questions. We have three minutes for questions. <laughs> no one? Be bold. Anything which I should talk more about which fits into three minutes? Any slide I should jump back to? No? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>